All right. It's live. Well, hey, Nick, how you doing? Hey, great to see you, Steve. Thanks for having me here. Appreciate it. Hey, likewise. Uh, same to you. I think the last time we got together or saw each other was at, uh, at Pulse back at in, Pulse, in our August. conference. Yeah, great, great to have you there. It was awesome. It was uh, nice. my first Pulse, our first Pulse. So that was, that was really fun. You got another one coming up soon, right? Yeah, we do. So Pulse, for folks that don't know, is a conference we do that's really the community event for customer success, not about Gainsight, but just bringing people together, talk about customer success, and actually increasingly talk about education and community and just the bigger world of customer experience. And so we do one in San Francisco every year, um, well, except for a couple of years with COVID. And then we yeah. do, we're doing one in London in November, um, which will be really fun. That's awesome. So it's in London this year. That'll be great. Yeah, yeah, we try to do one because there's a lot of, there might even be people on this uh, virtual event from Europe. There's a lot of customer success and customer experience activity happening in Europe, which is really great. Oh, it's cool. And so it looks like we're starting to flow the, yeah. the attendees on. Uh, it's great to see you. Uh, Chris, Francois, Hyun, Jesse, awesome. Thanks for thanks for joining us and, and a bunch more flowing in. Um, Nick just mentioned that he's going to be out in Europe. With the Gainsight team doing Pulse. If anyone's from uh, anyone's from Europe, uh, let us know. Um, we uh, a big part of our conversation today is going to be about community, and I'd love to just kind of think about this little webinar here as as a community in a way. And, yeah. And, uh, the main thing we want to kind of do is make sure we're we're answering everybody's questions. So uh, instead of kind of waiting to the end and having a hard break for Q and A, you know, drop your questions into the Q and A or, or drop them into the chat. Say hello. And uh, let us know what's top of mind for you. That ultimately, this is, you know, this is about this is about what you want to hear. And uh, Nick and I will do our best to make sure we we address everything. So if you got questions, go ahead and, and drop them right in. <clears throat> so Nick, you got uh, some other. So so Pulse is obviously coming up. Um, I know I've been on the road a ton over the past yeah. couple of weeks. It's it's I gotta say it's great to see in person events back and and really back. Uh, oh, it's amazing. How, how's it been? I mean, how's it been for you? Have you been doing some other events too? Yeah, so much travel. I mean, I love it. I, same with you. I get so much energy getting to meet people in the community and customers. And I think they have, everyone has so much energy seeing people right now, just given, you know, some, a brief uh, interlude where we weren't able to do that for a few years. And so uh, between that and then actually a lot of personal travel, I was telling you, I took mm -hmm. my daughter to Pittsburgh, where I grew up for one weekend. My, my oldest is um, graduating from high school this year. And so we're doing college visits, the two of us. So I've, I've been traveling like almost every, actually every week since I think like April or March. Um, so what's amazing is I got home from our most recent visit on Monday and I'm going to be home for seven days in a row, which I feel like is pretty, pretty special. So, oh, that's good. That's seven nice. days in a row. Thing. That's kind of a sad, sad record. But, and inside <laughs> that we, we, we've done, you know, we did our pulse event, which is our big kind of customer community conference. We're doing the same one in, in Europe, uh, in, in London in a couple of weeks in November. And then we did an event for, um, chief customer officers, um, that we do twice a year to bring together senior leaders. This was in Palm Springs, um, a few weeks ago. Ooh. And um, you know, we'll talk more about it, but you know, hot topic is how do you connect together all parts of the customer journey between you know onboarding, customer success, adoption, community, education. How do you tie it all together into one uh, unified journey? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, let's let's kind of let's jump right in. So yeah, uh, before we just kind of run a quick couple intros here uh, for all the attendees on the line, uh, thank you so much for jumping in. I mentioned earlier, but if you kind of popped in over the past couple of seconds, Nick and I really want to make this uh, about what you want to hear about. So um, if you if you're up for it, drop your, you know, drop your name, drop your company, where are you from, drop that into chat. Uh, and, uh, and most importantly, let us know what you want to hear about. Let us know your questions. So use the chat or use the Q&A function there and zoom and get your get your questions in, get your topics in, and we'll scan through those as we're talking through and try to answer them. Uh, right up front. But anyway, we'll, we'll get started. So my name is Steve Cornwell. I'm the founder and CEO of North Pass. I know we got a bunch of North Pass customers here. So thank you for being here. Uh, and, uh, and then we have Nick. So Nick, tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, sure. Um, great to meet folks that I haven't met before. I'm the CEO of Gainsight. Um, we launched Gainsight about 10 years ago. And you know the whole vision of the company is that um, as businesses move to subscription and recurring revenue business models, 
um, more and more of the value of kind of the business is about not just getting new customers, but keeping and growing those existing customers. We, we today refer to that concept as durable growth. How do you grow in a more durable way? We've seen, you know, the last few years, companies trying to grow at all costs, getting, throwing a ton of sales and marketing and getting new customers. But the most efficient and durable way to grow is through your existing customers by, by keeping them longer, by getting them to buy more products and services from you, and also by getting them to be bigger advocates. That's often measured now in the industry as in the metric of net revenue retention. And so again, we're all about helping our clients improve net revenue retention to be able to build a durable growth business. The way we do that is, you know, we build technology around customer success and making your customer success team more scalable, technology around community, getting your customers connected together, technology around your product and actually understanding how people use your product and driving better adoption of your product. And then the biggest thing we do is try to get you know, people together connected to learn from each other. So we run the world's largest community on customer success and have written several books on it, things like that. Yeah, yeah, pick up the books, jump, jump into the community. Uh, it, it's awesome. Well, thanks, Nick. Thanks for joining us. You mentioned durable growth. That's obviously yeah. top of mind right now. I, I kind of like to say like efficiency, you know, is, is cool again yeah, uh, in, right. in the economy, <laughs> which is which is refreshing, right? I, I um it was interesting. I, I uh, read a report from Bessemer Venture Partners, and they showed this data, and it showed that a year ago, when it comes to like valuate, valuing companies, uh, a dollar of ARR growth was equal to six dollars of free cash flow, and now it's one to one. Basically, saying like, hey, like a, a profitable based model is is, is more valuable. Right, so, exactly. um, I'm kind of curious. Like, you know, you've been studying this space. Like, why do you think it's taken? an economic shock to like transition back to a more, you know, uh, durable or, or, or model. Yeah. I, I think it's pretty simple. It's I mean, just not to oversimplify it, but fundamentally it's uh, when money is cheap with interest rates and quantitative easing. Um, what, what happens is uh, the financial models for value in companies end up valuing a lot that that money that's very far in the future, right? So mm -hmm. you can have a business that's going to lose a ton of money for a long time, grow really fast and eventually make money, you know, dot, dot, dot. Uh, if you're a Seinfeld fan, yada, 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 you eventually <laughs> make money, right? And so that, that if you have a 0% a interest rate, the money way in the future is worth the same as the money in the present. That's kind of what's crazy and counterintuitive. But now in a world of more realistic interest rates that are higher, uh, it's much more important to be able to deliver money along the way. Meaning you can't just say, eventually we're going to get profitable. Eventually you're going to figure out how to efficiency. Eventually we're going to get durable. But for now, we're just going to grow at all costs. You know, investors want to see that progress along the way. And so that's basically mm -hmm. caused a revaluation, as you were just alluding to, of how to think about valuing subscription businesses. It's no longer just about growth. It's about growth and the ability to be profitable, the efficiency, the durability of your growth. Yeah. And you mentioned net revenue retention, obviously top of mind for subscription based businesses. Are, are, what other KPIs, you know, are you seeing kind of come into into focus for for folks? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there's net revenue retention is sort of like the, the, the big picture. Right. But within that, you can break it down and you can say, OK, well, that to, if you improve your net revenue retention, part of that is your gross retention. And that's actually something that's super important to measure on its own. And what just for people that don't know, net revenue retention is like looking at all my customers, my existing customers, and then maybe a year later, have they grown in collective spend? Have they shrunk in collective spend? So that number could be 150%. It could be 90%. Basically, it's unbounded. Um, gross revenue retention is saying, okay, look at a set of customers a year later without counting anything new that they bought, without counting new products and services. Are they spending the same amount of money or less? So gross revenue retention is capped at 100%. And, you know, it's basically another way to think about churn. Churn is what you know, hundred percent minus gross revenue retention, right? Mm -hmm. And so the concept is with gross revenue retention, it's about keeping your customers, making sure they're still seeing the value. Net revenue retention adds in the ability to expand. And the reason gross revenue retention is so important is it's really a fundamental measure of the product market fit of your business, right? What is the fit of your business? If you have a 60% gross revenue retention, honestly, your company, unless you get that fixed, is just going to go out of business. Like there's no, there's no solution to the problem. Your company is basically worthless. 
if you have a 70% gross revenue retention, you, you're an okay business. You'll get a decent, a, a, a small multiple of revenue. If you're an 80%, you're a pretty good business. If you're 90, you're a great business. You know, and so that's that's why people look at that. So you've got net revenue retention, you've got gross revenue retention. And then the other financial metric people look at more and more is your efficiency of actually keeping those customers. So one yep. way to think about that is what percentage of your annual recurring revenue are you spending on customer success, right? I'm a huge fan of customer success, right? But nobody wants to just throw people at the problem, you know, and it just doesn't work if you want to be efficient and durable. And so what percentage of your ARR are you spending on customer success? Those are the three most common, what, what I'd call lagging indicators, meaning they're the financial metrics that eventually are the result of all the work in customer success and education and services and so on. Then you've got your leading indicators. What are the things that are going to predict that? And so often people will build what's called a customer health score, which is a, a way to kind of take a bunch of data together, kind of add it up, combine it, and then use that as a way to predict your gross revenue retention, your net revenue retention, and so on. Customer health scores um, often include things like product adoption, NPS, net promoter score, um, support activity, customer engagement, you know, things like that. Yeah, yeah, I love it. What, uh, what do you think has been or will be like just the kind of the hardest whether it's like cultural shift or mindset shift or operational shift, what do you see like a, a barrier to, to transitioning to this new model of, of durable yeah, growth? Totally. What is yeah. it? Yeah, there's, there's several for sure. I mean, I think there's one barrier, which is fundamentally in a growth at all costs um, model, you know, the answer to most decisions is and right? Like, yeah, we'll do that and that. We'll do that trade show and we'll do that event and we'll hire that person. We'll get that CSM. We'll do the operations. We'll do the finance. We're going to hire all those people, right? Like, and we've all been through that the last few years. Uh, in a durable growth model, the answer is, or am I going to do this or that? And so uh -huh. the mindset is hard. Now to answer the, or you got to get really good at understanding what's working, what really matters in your business, what's really driving results. There's a lot of things in your company and all of our, including mine, that are super well done and nice people, but not driving results that matter for your business. And so this idea of like being really shifting from an and to an or mindset, it's hard. It's hard for me. It's hard for all of us. And then doing a lot of analytics to understand what's really working. So that's kind of one big shift. A second big shift is um, not always throwing people at the problem. In, in, a, in a world of like crazy growth, grow at all costs, you're just trying to keep keep up. And so you're just like, how do we hire more people? Where do we get them from, right? Give them whatever signing bonus they need. Just get get more people in here. And yep. as an example, <laughs> the, the world of customer success, how do we just hire more CSMs, right? Um, but in this new world, you've got to be saying, how do we do more with digital, right? Whether it's making customers better educated or letting them connect with peers in the community or doing more in the product or automating some of the communications or, or having a, a pooled approach to CSM versus named CSMs. There's a lot of different things you can do, but this concept of digital customer success and the digital journey, it's the hottest thing right now because it's the only way you're gonna solve the math problem. The math problem is your CFO has probably told you no more budget for headcount, right? No more yeah. hiring or, or as little as possible. And- you need to preserve your retention because it matters so much, particularly in a downturn. So what do you do? The only way to do it is through automation, digital, all that kind of stuff. And so what we're seeing, I actually was talking to a customer yesterday and he said, I went to my CFO and I said, um, he, he was going to hire, you know, 10 people next year. And he told his CFO, I only need five and just give me some money for technology, operations, process, so we can stop throwing people at the problem. So that's the second thing. So I said, moving from and or, thinking not just about throwing people at the problem. And then the third one is, I think, a mindset shift that's probably the hardest, which is, um, you know, we've lived in a world of incredible abundance the last few years, right? I mean, you just think about like the average employee and it's like you're getting job offers every day and, you know, you can double your salary going from here to here. Your company's stock is going up a lot. You might've invested in crypto and that's going up a lot. Your home prices are going up a lot. You know, if you're fortunate enough to own, own a home, right? All these things are happening and it all just feels so great. And um, a lot of it was frankly just propped up by, you know, low interest rates and everything else. And so we're in a new world where it's going to be more challenging, you know, to work a lot harder. It's going to be harder to move up. It's going to be harder. Your company is going to have to work harder. And I think that mindset shift, I, I hate, I hate to kind of throw cold water on it, but it's the reality. It's like taking the red pill in the matrix, right? 
that <laughs> is just the new reality. It's very hard for people to accept, but that new reality is one we have to all embrace and lean into. And by the way, we'll be able to build great companies through this. Um, and I think we'll also all do well really personally, but you have to accept that the world is just totally different and you almost have to forget what happened the last five years. It's like it was a different universe. <laughs> so yeah. those are my three three things. I love that. I, and I love the or uh, uh, reality. And uh, I think, you know, we, we've been looking at uh, that like in, in our business as well. And I, I actually think it's it's kind of fun. It's challenging because exactly. it, it, it just forces us all to have constraints. And, and I think that unlocks different levels of creativity, which is why, you know, we, we get to, we all get to a good place. So I, I agree. Uh, I, I wrote something recently. I, I talked about how I think growth at all costs, you know, the old world, it actually hurts everyone long-term, right? Like you just think about it, you know, everyone's just like working frenetically just to keep up. And by the way, like, you're not really doing a good job, you know, it like, you're just kind of sloppy, right? Like hiring people, not really thinking about whether they're right fit or not. And your culture gets worse. And by the way, like you're, you're just trying to grow. So you're kind of jamming customers with sales. Your product isn't as good. Like I think slowing down, being more thoughtful allows us to do much better work and doing good work is a big part of like the satisfaction of, of a job. Right. Yeah. And so I think these, this decision-making on the, or being more analytical, not throwing people at the problem, just taking the red pill on this stuff. It is, it is mm -hmm. kind of very satisfying once you get your head around it. For sure. Now, so in this kind of new world here of of or operations, uh, we we essentially need like a new playbook for growth. Yeah. Um, Gainsight's authored the the durable growth playbook. You kind of touched on it a little earlier, um, but uh, tell us just a, a little bit more. Just un unpack yeah. that a little bit for us. What's what is this playbook all about? Yeah. So we we at our Pulse conference, which we we're uh, grateful that you attended. Um, you know, we announced this idea of the durable growth playbook. And the concept was, okay, just as you alluded to, the way investors value companies now has shifted radically from growth at all costs to a mix of growth and efficiency. We call that durable growth. Durable growth is measured in terms of your net revenue retention. So how do you actually maximize your net revenue retention? And we basically shared six things that we think the best companies are doing to maximize net revenue retention, maximize durable growth, and ultimately maximize the value of your company. So number one is, is like what I consider the foundation, um, which is you can't have any surprises anymore. You can't be surprised by customers not getting value or not using your product well or having a poor experience. Like this is 2022. You have so much data. You should be using it and you should be much more organized. And if you're not like fix that right away, you won't get through the next few years if you don't, if you don't have that. Number two is then um, really remembering that customer success and customer centricity can't just be an inside out thing. It can't just be about starting with your goals of, you know, I want to retain my customers and expand them. Cause I'll tell you, your customers don't care about your net revenue retention rate. They don't care about your sales goals, right? They care about getting value. And so the second thing people are doing is bringing the customer more into that process of customer success. What does that mean? Well, it means defining what they need to do to be successful, right? And people call that a joint success plan. It's not just what you're going to do as a vendor for your customer. It's like, what do they need to do? By the way, a great example yeah. of that is in many cases, they need to go through training, right? Like you've seen that. And you, I mean, if your customer is not trained and enabled, I'm sure many people listening agree with this. They're not going to be able to get a lot of value out of it, right? The customer also has to help share their goals, what they're kind of trying to get done. So the second thing is really bringing that customer into the process. A great way to do that, by the way, is community. Because then you get them engaged with other customers, just like the folks that are on here right now, right? Learning from each other, things like that. So bring the customer into customer success. Third one is um, stop throwing people at the problem. Scale through digital. I alluded to this before, mm -hmm. right? Like you don't need to think about every single problem as I got to hire another person. And by the way, digital isn't just for your small customers. Like a, a, the kind of naive understanding is, oh, great. Digital is our small customers. The large customers get high touch. What's happening is, all customers want a really easy experience. And sometimes the easiest experience is digital, right? For example, if I'm a customer, do I want to get on a web, a web conference, a Zoom, Zoom meeting with my uh, CSM or about, about a new feature? Or do I want to just see a little guide in the product? I want to yep. see a guide in the product. Do I want to have to, um, you know, a set up a quarterly business view for 90 minutes? Or do I want to be able to just get quick content nurtured to me throughout, based on my behavior, right? Do I want to like have to have a very 
um, expensive, you know, travel to go to a conference or whatever, or don't just go into an online community and ask other customers some questions, right? So those kinds of things is scale through digital. Number four, go on offense. So it's easy in these downturns to get very you know, defensive, but the truth is customers are looking to consolidate into fewer vendors and to do more with what they have. And so if you're a company that has multiple solutions, or maybe you're being used in one part of your customer, but not others, this is the time to go to them and say, hey, we think we can save you money, simplify your environment, deliver more value by consolidating, right? By the way, mm -hmm. if you're not doing that, another vendor is doing that and you're going to get edged out. So you better jump on that right away and be the first one to bring it up to the customer. Number yeah. five, the best way to scale is through your product. I alluded to this before, but the whole concept people I'm sure have heard of product led growth, which is a very hot term of like, how do we grow through our product? How do we understand how people are using our product? How do we make the product better based on all the feedback we get from customers in the process of education and community in CSM, right? That collaboration between the kind of post sales uh, function, which I don't love the term post sales, by the way, that's why I put in air quotes, but you know, all the people that work with customers after the initial sale, and the product team, that collaboration needs to be tighter. It's getting much tighter. And then finally, what we call human first business, the idea that put aside the digital and the community and education, at the end of the day, it's human beings at your, your team working with human beings at the customer. And remember, in times of challenge, empathy is so important, right? Really understanding what that customer is trying to do, being empathetic to what their business is going through, because they're probably going through cost cutting, maybe layoffs, other things as well being really empathetic and, and really remembering the human side of it. So those six ideas are what we call the durable growth playbook. And it's really what we're seeing, you know, the best, you know, subscription businesses adopting to get through the next few years. Hey, uh, thank you. Thanks for unpacking that, Nick. And I think totally. one of the things that I think is really interesting is this is so cross-functional, right? It's not just no, one yeah, totally. person. And we had a question come in from Chris, uh, who's been in, uh, talking about kind of C, the evolution of CX, the evolution of RevOps. And his question was, you know, what do we think is going to be the next uh, key role in the, in the go-to-market chain? Uh, I think this is a really interesting one yeah. for right now, right? I mean, I know I've seen uh, a huge rise and uptick of the chief customer officer. Yep. Uh, we've seen a lot in community. We've seen a lot of uh, uh, in, in education as well. Right. So there's been some new roles that I think snap really well kind of into this. What, what do you, what are your perspectives on like some of the key roles in making growth durable? Totally. Yeah. So one of the things that's becoming very mainstream, as you said, Steve, is uh, if you're, if you have enough scale, you know, if you're, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 million of ARR, having a chief customer officer for sure. And a lot of people are saying, well, I'm going to put all the parts of that experience for the customer under one leader. And that means support, implementation and services, education, community, and customer success, all under one leader who can think about that problem holistically. So that's become pretty mainstream. Um, and, and anyone of scale is, for the most part, doing that. Now, the next level of kind of innovation, um, you're seeing a lot more focus on strategy and operations inside that chief customer officer role, right? So as I said, it's not just about throwing bodies at the problem. So who's doing that analysis to see what's working and what's not, where to focus and where not? You know, in sales, you have that. That's called sales operations, right? That's a very well understood field. You know, nobody would build a big sales organization and have nobody thinking about territories and comp plans and process, right? You, those roles are really important. CS operations is one of the fastest growing fields. Um, a lot of people are hiring like senior people for it to lead it. And that's that's a big area. And then within that, as I alluded to, because digital is such a hot topic, you're seeing more and more of the emergence of the digital customer success role. And that's a role that's not about managing customers directly. It's about developing programs that span you know, in product, education, community, email, to kind of create this digital journey for the customer. And so that digital customer success is probably the, the frontier, like the cutting edge of, what, of new roles. Yeah. Totally. So CS operations, digital customer success. Yep. Uh, Chris, thanks a ton for, for your question. Uh, for, every, for anybody else who's got questions, uh, drop them into the Q&A. We'll try to get them answered uh, right in line with our conversation here. So well, I have a question for the audience. I, we've talked about efficiency. We've talked about um, durable growth. We, we've talked about uh, kind of all the components of that. Uh, I'd like to launch a, a poll. Uh, and the, the question is, 
has your company increased its investment in durable growth over the past couple of months or the past yeah. year? This could be customer success. Uh, this could be uh, uh, the, the digital side, the community side, the education side, the health scoring side. You know, uh, really, really interested in uh, seeing what the audience says. So some of the options there are, yes, there's been tons of investment. Hey, we've done a little bit. No, not really. Uh, everything stale, go, go, go with, with sales. Uh, or, or maybe you've already been best in class for a while. So we'll give that a few seconds to let that roll that. in. And then I'm so, uh, eager. I'm so eager to see the results. This is going to be interesting. Let's see where we're at. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Look at this. Wow. It's pretty, that's wow. pretty lopsided. I love this. Very good. Great. Great job, audience. That's awesome. So st almost 70%. I'm not sure if anybody can see it, but the results, I'll just read them out. It's about, it's almost 70% said yes. Lots of noticeable focus and investment. So great to see. And then really the other pieces, uh, somewhat, and then only 10% was, was not really. So great to see, you know, the, the rotation. You mentioned, uh, we, we talked about, um, Nick, we talked about uh, digital. We talked yep. about um, uh, operations. Um, I've, we, we've talked a little bit about education. I'd love to kind of pivot there and, and uh, talk about education a bit. Um, oh. I've heard you, you say in the past that, you know, education is really the core um, of, of customer success. Why, why do you believe that? And, and why, is, why is education so powerful in your mind? Yeah, I mean, it's, it is, it's interesting because we've talked about that for years, even just in our own business. So, you know, Steve, I'm sure you, you, you've seen this experience with a lot of your clients where, you know, you, you start out in CS, like in the very beginning of a company. And what's a CSM doing? They are meeting with clients and explaining to them how to use the product, right? Like that's, what, and then getting feedback, obviously, right? Um, but a lot of what they're doing in the very early days of a startup is a one-on-one -on -one education. I remember our first like CSM, like our, she was like our all-time like great CSM, Elaine Cleary. And she would do all these, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, like at the time it was like WebEx meetings with clients, right? And explaining how to use the first version of Gainsight, right? Like way, way back when. Now we didn't call it education. They're just like CSM. That's just what you do, right? But you're, you're training the customer. And um, when you think about it, what is the goal of education in a more fundamental level? And by the way, I'm, I'm, I'll take a stab. I'd love to hear your, your definition. But from my perspective, you know, part of education's goal is you're imparting knowledge with the goal of being able to help people change their behavior to achieve whatever goals they have. And so what when you think about what is customer success, you are trying to help provide knowledge and best practices so the customer changes the behavior so they get goal, the value out of whatever you're doing. So customer success and education are almost like the same thing in a way. And when you think about it practically and you talk to most vendors and you actually talk to most CSMs and you say, what's what's the what's in common amongst your best clients, right? What's What are the common things? And we do this at site. It's like, my gosh, like our best clients are the ones that have gone through our training. Like we have a certification mm -hmm. process for Gainsight. And we we uh, we have an amazing person that runs that, Lila Meyer. She runs our training. And, you know, she's got these great charts that show like people that have been through certification versus not. And every single metric from NPS to retention rate, everything is better when somebody's been certified, right? When they've gone through training, when they they're So I think at a theoretical level, education is fundamental to what customer success is about. At a practical level, education is one of the best levers to get the outcomes you want from customer success. Yep. Yeah. I mean, when you look at, when I look across our, you know, our implementation, our onboarding, our customer success motions, our support motions and everything in between, when you actually go and you, know, you read the emails or you, you, you listen to the recorded calls or you, you look at the tickets or you kind of participate in the meetings, what, at, no matter what function that is, what we're really doing there is we're educating yeah. clients, right? We're, we're trying really hard to, to make sure they understand how to use the product, totally. zoom out for a little bit what what they can do with the product how they can get uh, uh value from the product right Not, let alone how to actually use it and so it is really interesting when you when you look at the actual words or the uh, whether they're written whether they're verbal that are coming out of uh the the whole uh team that's servicing the the customers it really is all education right yeah so, and, it's, and, uh, and it's interesting because one thing i'll add to that is i think part of that requires us to maybe step out of what might be the narrow definition of education. So of course, 
one type of education and software is people going through like a certification program or a training class of some kind, right? Maybe using your software to do that. And I think that is like a huge part of education. Of course, for the like hardcore users are going to go through that time and commitment. And then as you alluded to, you're educating them in all other parts of the journey. Like every time you do a call with them as a CSM, you're educating them. Every time you send them an email, automated email with the best practice tip, you're educating them. Every time you do an onboarding call, you're educating them. When they're in your community, they're being educated by each other, right? Like yeah. you're in product pop-ups are educating them. So yeah, I totally agree with you. Education is the thread that connects the entire journey together. Now, customer education uh, in, in concept isn't something new, but in the past couple of years, I mean, even if you just like look at the the Google trends yeah, of, of right. search volume over the past couple of years, it's just it's gone way up. Well, um, what do you think is causing kind of the the acceleration or the, the the bigger embrace of of a of a more formal education program? Yeah, and I'd love to hear your perspective on this too, by the way. But I'll I'll take a stab at it, just like seeing the space from a little bit of an outside in perspective. it's very clear that people are changing the way they think about it, right? So I do think there was a historical view that it was a bit of like a cost of doing business. And at best, it was a new revenue center and services, right? So yeah, I've got my education business. I'm going to generate a certain amount of revenue and, and margin and so on. And at worst, it was just like a cost of doing business. And because of that, you know, I think a lot of people just lumped it together with internal education. Oh, it's just like education. We'll do it for our clients. We'll do it for our team. And you know, whether they're taking the internal compliance certification or they're taking our product training, it's all kind of the same thing, right? And unfortunately, because of that, you had a lot of really dated uh, experiences in terms of customer education. That's why many of us, <laughs> we think of online education. We don't always have the best images in mind because it's usually the latest employee uh, compliance training you went through, right? Yeah, it's a but now we'll take this You course. have to and you click <laughs> next, next, next through all the videos or whatever. And, but what's what's happened is interesting is I think the new way of measuring subscription businesses, the new accounting, which as I alluded to is about measuring you know net revenue retention, gross revenue retention, it created a way to like find the attribution, the value for what education is, right? So education isn't just a services revenue line item, nor is it just a cost of doing business. It's a huge lever in some of the most important metrics in your business, name, namely gross revenue retention, net revenue retention, durable growth, right? It's like a key part of that. And I think a lot of companies learned this by doing it, right? They, they basically started out they had a bunch of CSMs and then, you know, the CSMs are doing work and then they start, you know, they introduce, just like we did, you introduce, you hired an education person, mainly just to offload the CSMs. You know, initially it's an efficiency play, right? It's like, oh, okay, why would I do one-to-one training when I could do one-to-many? Awesome. Great. So you buy software from your company, you implement that. But then what you realize is you start looking at those customers that have gone through the training versus not. And you're like, oh, wow, they're expanding faster. They're retaining more. They're higher NPS. This isn't just an efficiency play. This is truly like one of the best levers for durable growth. And so I think everyone's kind of going through that maturity process and it's amazing how different it is from a few years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I think some of the, some of the things too, that, you know, we're seeing is the, just some of the business model changes. So, you Mm -hmm. know, we've gone from to like largely a recurring revenue economy Right, obviously, in in SaaS, you know, it, it, that's that's the the foundation of our 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 business models. But we're seeing recurring revenue in in other uh, parts of the the economy as well. Yes, so totally. I think like that that relationship, that ongoing relationship. How do you maintain and grow? You know, that ongoing relationship and education is a huge part of that, right? Because kind of second to that is innovation, the pace of innovation has changed so much. And so I think just the the amount of uh, new capabilities coming into products on a higher frequency yes, basis, that's you really good. have to sit there and go like, how, how do we, how do we educate people on these, uh, th- this, you know, this quarterly or sometimes this monthly, I mean, heck, some, some companies ship every single week, right? So how do we make sure we're continuously educating people on all these capabilities without having to have a a set meeting with the CSM to personally guide people through. So I, I think some like just economic shifts have played a, 
that's a really key in this. I think both of those are so right. You have the subscription relationship, you know, fundamentally change everything. And I think that innovation point is a really good one where people thought of education as a one-time thing, right? It's, I mean, go back to the old world, you're in a classroom and you're, you're going through your training. And by the way, that probably worked in the 1990s, right? For some software, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you, maybe you're implementing SAP and you go through the SAP training and you install SAP on your, in your servers. And you're probably not going to upgrade it for like 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, once that thing's installed, you don't mess with it. And so, right. but then as you observe, like for your company or my company or any SaaS company, you're shipping things like every week, every quarter. And so education is this forever thing. It's not a one-time thing, which by the way, is probably similar to how education's evolving for all of us in real world too, right? Like it's not like the computer science class I took in 1994 on introduction to C is at all relevant to programming right now. So if I wanted to be a continue to be an engineer, I got to continue to dust up my skills, right? And so um, it is a continuous process. I think the other piece of it too is, and this is so exciting, um, is uh, just the, I think the, the new recognized value of the customer success team and, and all yes. the capacity you know that this that the team has to to drive growth to drive revenue so if you want to unlock that team to drive gross retention as you mentioned drive net retention how do you remove certain kind of uh, repetitive pieces from them uh, i was talking to one of our customers the other day uh she's actually on here elena shout out to you uh and uh, she told me that um ever since she started running the education program, her implementation team doesn't do the routine training uh, totally. anymore. And so now yeah. they can go and drive value and they can build more valuable configurations or integrations or whatever kind of the nuance of that software is That's instead awesome. of doing training. So pretty cool. Um, I think uh, another question I have is um, education has traditionally been embraced by like the big companies, right? Yeah. So you mentioned kind of like education services revenue. That's, you think of like huge companies for that. What about now? You know, is this, and I guess maybe even broader, just digital digital uh, customer success and, and education community. Is this big companies, little companies? Oh, no, no. Kind of seeing this? I'm glad you mentioned that because I think that, that that was probably the old mindset was, mm -hmm. you know, scale to start with a lot of people and then eventually we'll figure out digital and, education and whatever. And I think the things that have changed that, what one is of course the forcing function of the economy and valuations, everything we've talked a lot about, right? People have to get efficient a lot sooner than they used to. But I think that probably the more interesting thing is the modern customer expectation, not by everyone, by the way. I saw there's a good question uh, that was in there about, you know, does everyone really want a digital journey? No, no, for sure. Some people want a high touch, that's great. But there's a lot of people out there that want, digital, right? They want self-service. They want on-demand, right? All whatever buzzword you want to use. And mm -hmm. um, in particular, they want to be enabled to do things on their own, right? Like they want to be enabled to like get educated on their own. And frankly, I think it's weird if you use a product now in 2022, in 22, um, in, in this, like in, in like this year, this era that basically doesn't let me do stuff on my own right? I have to do a meeting with you guys to like change the configuration. I need to do an executive business review with you just to understand, you know, the latest features of the product. Like why, right? When I use sure. any modern software, you don't have to, everything is right there, right? It's right in the, in the product or online. And so I think it's changed the way people prioritize these things. Digital is no longer the thing you do eventually. It's often the thing you do from the beginning. Yeah. So one of the Last things I want to touch on here is um, before we kind of move into any of the the Q and A, Nick is community. I know you know Gainsight's really uh, big on on community. Education fosters community, yeah. right? In in a really really big way. Um, you know, people learning together, people yep. sharing together. Kind of would love your perspective. You know, how have you how have you seen education foster community or play a key role in in the development of community? Yeah, it's interesting because part of it is like defining what's community, right? And so we actually mm -hmm. um, spent a lot of time thinking about this. And fundamental community is this idea that like there's a bunch of people that have a feeling of kind of common beliefs and belonging and shared goals, right? That's like what community in the generic sense is, right? And I think what ends up happening is in a in a B2B company, which I presume most people here are, you've got your customers 
that actually are all doing a job that's similar from company to company. And frankly, in their own company, they might feel like a little bit alone, right? They're like, oh, I'm the only person that does this. But actually the thing that binds them together is the other people in the other companies doing the same thing. And you have this opportunity to bring those people together, make them feel that connection, make them feel that belonging, right? And so community is definitely one of the hottest strategies in business right now. There's a term people are starting to use called community-led growth, right? How do you start with the community and then actually build your business on top of that, which is really interesting. A lot of good examples of that out there. But one of the things that I think binds a community together is people that feel like they're actually all learning together and also at similar levels so they can learn from each other. And this is why, you know, let's use Salesforce as the ultimate example with Trailblazer, which is the community they have, or any other example, right? Where you, you build a community of your, your people that have gone through training and education and or want to continue to learn, like that actually haven't stopped. They want to keep learning. That is the most powerful community because they, they've they already like anteed up and said, okay, yeah, I've gone through basic training. I, I know the basics of this product, but I want to get great at this. And I want this peer group to help me get great by, by the way, giving me feedback and support, but also maybe challenging me, showing me what they did and maybe making me feel a little FOMO. Why am I not doing that? Showing me the certification they got. And, and so there's this really good virtuous cycle between community and education, um, which is why I'm super excited about what you're doing. Yeah. Awesome. There's a question on this topic from uh, in uh, in our Q and A here, and it's about the the tech stack to yeah. kind of bring bring this together, right? Um, Chris says, um, can you talk about steps and tech tools or categories of tech tools needed to pull this community led growth strategy together? So, um, Nick, kind of, what are some of your? I guess if you think like categorically, yeah. or or Here's kind of, the, what are your thoughts on that? Totally. Yeah. Here's the buckets that we're seeing in our client base. Um, so um, obviously you got, you typically you've got a, you, you still have some level of human high touch, you know, CSMs and onboarding and stuff, managing customers. So there's sort of the, the workflow for those people. That's what, you know, Gainsight's first product is, is kind of customer success workflow. So that's, that's one thing, right? It's good, always going to be there. And you want to have that interact with the other parts of the digital stack well. Then you've got your online community, right? So that might be a, a forum that you set up where your customers connect with each other. You know, we we have a product in that area called Insided. There's other, other solutions out there as well. And that's important because you want to have your own community. But then there's also third-party communities. Like no matter what you do, if you're successful, your customers will create their own communities, right? It might be on Slack. It might be on Stack Overflow. It might be- They're on, probably already out there, right? They're yeah, probably, they're probably exist, right? And yeah. so there's actually some pretty cool technology. It's very emerging, very young companies uh, doing community analytics, helping you understand what's happening in the other communities around you. So I think that's an interesting little, little but interesting area that you know we're seeing. So, so you've got this kind of community. That's one part of digital. But then the other parts of digital are in product. So how do I understand people using my product and also- guiding them in the product through kind of messages and pop-ups and stuff like that. So that's an area that very hot. We have a product in that area called Gainsight PX and everyone is doing something in that area. That's kind of universal now in SaaS. Mm -hmm. Then you've got your um, uh, education world, right? And so we really are huge believers that that needs its own area that needs its own kind of standalone education, but ideally also have it be integrated into the over time into the app and other parts of the journey. And then tying that all together, you need to have some way to orchestrate that journey, right? Because you don't want it to feel like, oh, okay, I got this email about education and CSM's reaching out to me and I got a community invite. Like it should all be orchestrated and coordinated along the journey. And so that idea of like journey orchestration for the digital journey, that's a that's kind of the, the heart of what we do. It's called Gainsight Journey Orchestrator. And I, whether it's us or somebody else, having some cohesive way to connect all these pieces together so that it doesn't feel like a disjoint experience. Because that's the risk I think we all run is we're all so excited yeah. about this stuff. And then education's doing their thing and marketing's doing their thing and community. And then it's like worse. The customer's getting spam. They stop reading your emails and then good luck, right? So yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> well, look, I know we got to uh, I know we got to wrap up uh, in just a couple minutes here. It's got one more question in from Mark. Uh, Mark said, in your opinion, who should own the education program? Uh, this one's near and dear to my heart, so I'll, yeah. I'll first stab at this one, Nick. But I, I think uh, you know, not not to give you the lazy answer, but it ultimately does depend on mm -hmm. kind of what you're looking to drive, right? I've seen, we've seen this. Uh, we've seen uh, the chief customer officer on right. this. We've seen um, we've seen the product chief product officer on this. We've seen this chief marketing officer on education. So it really, from our view, it kind of really looks at what metrics you're really trying to drive. You're trying to really 
drive product adoption and, and new feature adoption, you might want to consider that in, in the product area. If you're looking at uh, driving um, uh, uh, gross revenue retention and, you're, and uh, you're looking at kind of a continuous education program about kind of best practices, you might want to consider that in the chief customer officer area. So there's a lot of different ways you can slice that one. Love it. And Steve, I apologize, I have to go, but it's so great have, being here and uh, excited for all the innovation that you're driving for the education world. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Nick. And thanks so much, audience. Uh, we will uh, see you guys really soon. Cheers.